Our global news editor Yuri Fieser is joining me in the studio. That means that we're going to talk about the world politics and its impact on Ukraine in particular. So, Yuri, nice to see you. Nice to see you too, Odema. So, what are the questions we have to ask each other and the politics uh, during the last week? Who did it? What? Why and what would be the consequences? These are the questions I'm going to discuss and at least to try to answer today in my part of Spotlight Ukraine. And of course, I am talking about uh, the drone attacks that happened in Iran last Saturday. So get ready. This and more tonight in my part of Spotlight Ukraine. A series of powerful explosions were heard on Saturday night in several Iranian cities. Local media reported drones attacked military infrastructure facilities in several cities, including oil refineries and an ammunition production center in Isfahan. There was no electricity in the city of Hamdan, and almost all of Iran was experiencing problems with the Internet. The country's defense minister confirmed on the latter incident. At the same time, the drone attack was called unsuccessful. According to the ministry, one of the drones was shot down by an air defense system, and the other two fell into defense traps and exploded. The attack was attributed to the Israeli defense forces. However, there is no official confirmation of this yet. And the United States uh, uh, Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, has made comments about uh, this. He said earlier this week that Washington, together with uh, its allies and partners, is ready to fight malicious actions uh, that Iran is engaged in. And this is what he said. Not only is Iran providing sophisticated uh, military equipment uh, to uh, Russia, but Russia in turn is doing the same uh, with Iran, which is of course of real concern to us and real concern to Israel. Uh, so we continued uh, what has been an ongoing discussion of ways that we can continue to um, uh, work together, collaborate, um, and not just us, with other countries, in countering the malicious actions that Iran is engaged in, uh, whether it's in this region uh, or, um, uh, or beyond. And uh, uh, he explained then what he meant in the previous statement. While being with a visit in Jerusalem, Mr. Blinken said, let us hear. We continue to believe that the most effective way to deal with the international community's concerns about Iran's nuclear program is through diplomacy. Diplomacy is never off the table. But President Biden has also made clear that we are determined that Iran not acquire a nuclear weapon. And every option remains on the table to ensure that that doesn't happen. But our preferred path would be diplomacy. And this is rather a disturbing statement, I would say, especially if we take into account uh, what Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said. And he said exactly uh, about the retaliation to all the Israeli enemies uh, in the region, including Iran. Let us hear Mr. Netanyahu. The cabinet approved a series of steps in the fight against terrorism. On the one hand, we will step up the deployment and activity of the security forces. On the other, we will exact a price from those who carry out terrorist attacks and their supporters. We are not seeking escalation, but we are prepared for any possibility. Our answer to terrorism is an iron fist and a powerful, swift and precise response. Ilya Kusa, expert in global politics and Middle East in the Ukrainian Institute for Future, to talk more about these drones, drone attacks and the consequences uh, that they may have to the world in general and to the region of Middle East in particular. Mr. Kusa, greetings and thanks for joining us tonight. Hello, thank you for having me. Mr. Kusa, my first question to you would be as follows. So, can we at least try to answer the question right now? Who did it? Why? And what would be consequences? And I am talking about these drone attacks in Iran. Well, I think the answer is pretty clear. Uh, at least Western media made it pretty clear that uh, Israel is allegedly uh, uh, 
you know, made, uh, made this drone attack with the support of the United States. Actually, this is not the first incident, uh, and I think this is not the last one, because we saw the, the so-called secret war between Iran and Israel uh, has been ongoing for some time already, so for, for many years, especially uh, since 2018, when uh, the United States withdrew from the so-called nuclear agreement with Iran, which actually triggered uh, a new phase of confrontation between Israel and Iran. So I'm pretty sure that this was one of those uh, attacks uh, as part of the secret war uh, by Israel on one of the Iran Iranian military facilities. Uh, I think this attack was, on one hand, it was some, it was a signal sent by the United States and Israel to Iran in order to deter uh, Iranian government from further uh, exports exports of their weaponry to other countries because this is what they were uh, this is what they were concerned about that Iran has started to expand their export military capabilities by, for example, uh, selling weapons to Russia or uh, cooperating with China. So I think so. On one hand, it was this. Uh, it was the. It was a signal, a political one, uh, which which they sent to Iran. And on the, on the other hand, I think this was also. Uh, kind of a show, uh, a showcase of their capabilities that the United States and Israel are capable of attacking Iranian territory. And this is what they wanted to show, to demonstrate by, the, by this attack. Uh, by the way, Iran vowed to retaliate as well. <clears throat> Can this somehow complicate the situation in the Middle East? Yes, they have means to retaliate, uh, although not directly. They have always uh, confined to they have, they have always been confined to using proxy uh, uh, proxy instruments of, of, of waging a proxy war. You know, by uh, to to attack uh, their opponents not directly, but through intermediaries, like for example, through their forces that they have under their control in such countries as Syria, uh, Lebanon, or Iran. Iraq. So they have means, they have resources. I think they probably have options on how to retaliate. The only problem is that, uh, of course, they don't have uh, that much capabilities as Israel or the United States have technologically. So I think they will retaliate at some point, at some time in the future, but unfortunately we can't predict when. It's the same situation as it was after the 2020 uh, attacks on Iran when uh, when one of their nuclear scientists was killed in Tehran, and they also vowed to retaliate, but still uh, since then they, I mean, did a lot of things, a lot of stuff around the region. We are not sure which one of them was that kind of retaliation. But of course, they will continue to wage their secret war, uh, their covert war against Israel, the United States, and their allies, because this is what has been going on in the Middle East for several years right now. Yeah. Mr. Kusa, how regions uh, in the region, uh, how neighbors in the region, I mean in the region of the Middle East, react uh, to what happened in Iran? Uh, more or less passively, so I can say that there were uh, strong reactions to that. I mean, everyone got used to what's happening in Iran. As I said earlier, this is not the first such incident, uh, and not one, of, and not the the biggest one uh, in terms of destruction, for example. So this was a minor one, actually, compared to what was uh, to to similar attacks uh, on Iranian soil, for example, last year near the town of Kermanshah, where, when, where another air base was struck, or for example, uh, there was a, an act, uh, allegedly there was an act of sabotage on one of the nuclear objects, one of the nuclear facilities in Iran, in Iranian city of Natanz in July 2021. So everyone in the region, more or less, you got used to uh, these kind of attacks. They know that Israel and Iran are in the state of de facto war, and everyone is wary. Uh, the only thing everyone is wary about is they're concerned that so that they're concerned because they don't want this conflict to spin out of control and 
uh, you know, for example, go beyond Iranian borders uh, because no one wants a big war in the Middle East. A big regional war which would involve, for example, such countries as Saudi Arabia, uh, United Arab Emirates, Iraq, Pakistan, I mean, Iran, Iran's neighbors, it would be, it, it, is, it, it, it is believed to be uh, very destructive and, and, and actually uh, very, very, ha to have very ne negative impact on the region's uh, development, I mean, economic situation, humanitarian situation. So that's why everyone is okay as soon as this uh, conflict, you know, is confined to this covered action between Israel and Iran and, and does not spin out of control. Mr. Kusa, do I uh, correctly understand you that there will be, uh, fortunately, no sacred jihad right now against Israel? Well, there is no such thing as a sacred jihad, you know, against Israel. Uh, Iran and Israel are classic uh, enemies, I mean, regional competitors that have ambitions. They think they, they are engaged in a practically existential war and, uh, what is more important, in a, in a military, in a, in a sort of a competition, because uh, Israel wants, wants uh, apparently Israel wants to preserve their domination in the region, their technological and military superiority that they have now with the support of the United States, while, and they are not interested in Iran acquiring nuclear weapons, because in this case, Iran will be able to uh, tip the balance uh, in the region, the military balance, in its favor. This is something that Israel cannot uh, afford themselves, because, this, uh, because they see it as a direct threat to their national security and defense. So this is a classic situation where you have uh, several regional players uh, that want to dominate in the region, and of course they have contradictory agendas, and of course they have, and that's why they are trying to engage in different. Um, they are trying to strengthen their positions by intervening in regional uh, crisis playgrounds, for example, like Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, and wage proxy conflicts against each other. Why proxy conflicts? Because, as I said. They don't want to wage direct war against each other because it's too risky and, and too costly. Uh, what do you think? Can this drone attack somehow influence the military cooperation between Iran and Russia? And will Tehran continue to give Russia its drones and supplies and whatsoever? In my opinion, this drone attack uh, is not going to impede in any way uh, to impede Iran of uh, you know exporting weaponry to Russia because this is you know this is a one-time attack on one facility which. Uh, judging from the materials that we have, uh, the open material, open information that we have, has haven't hasn't uh, yeah, hasn't had much you know impact or destruction on that on that air base, air base. So I don't think such attack can actually neutralize Iran's military capabilities, for example, or capabilities to produce weapons that were including uh, drones that Russia purchased last year. So I think that Iran will continue to export weapons to Russia if they want to. I think that this they they haven't uh, decided yet, so there is no final decision on the ballistic missiles, for example. Uh, I think there are still negotiations both inside Iran, because not all Iranian political elite groups are eager to further co to further deepen cooperation with Russia. Not not everyone in Iran is happy with that, because you know Russia-Iran relations are pretty difficult historically. And uh, both on this level and outside of Iran, there are also negotiations. As I understand, uh, that there are negotiations between Iran and the West. Uh, that uh, Western countries want, uh, still want to negotiate with Iran, to engage in a meaningful dialogue, and to dissuade Iran from further uh, developing military and technological cooperation with Russia, because they understand that this, this is risky, and the more weapons Iran will export to Russia, the more this war will drag on and uh, drain more resources from the Western capital. So I think that the negotiations are still underway, but, I, but such attacks uh, are used by the United States and their allies as a signal, as, as I think as an instrument 
in these negotiations, you know, to try to coerce, to pressure Iran and, and to try to tell him that you shouldn't export weapons because then we will be forced to, you know, try to use force. Thank, Thank you. you very much, uh, Mr. Kusa, for joining us and for your insights. This was Ilya Kusa, expert in global politics and the Middle East in the Ukrainian Institute for the Future. Iran helps Russia in its aggressive war against Ukraine, but we know whatever they do, we will win. I mean, Ukraine will win uh, thanks to the bravery of the Ukrainian soldiers and thanks to the help and support we are getting from our European partners and allies. And we are now joined by Jonatas Vsevio, uh, Secretary General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Estonia, to talk about this help. Uh, greetings, Mr. Savio. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, coming to you from Washington, D.C., where I'm having discussions with our American friends on these very subjects. Uh, how best to help Ukraine, how best to raise the cost of aggression for uh, Russia, and how to work towards uh, ensuring there is no impunity for those who commit crimes of aggression and war crimes uh, in Ukraine today. So it's, it's a pleasure for me to join you. Thank you. It's a pleasure for us, Mr. Thank you, Jonathan. Mr. Vesu. Uh, so, in one of your tweets a few weeks ago, you wrote, and this is quote, as Russia continues its brutal war in Ukraine, European Union must uh, move on with the additional sanctions against Russia. Oil price recap must be uh, reviewed. Russia must be held accountable for the crime of aggression and European peace uh, facility support to Ukraine to be swiftly adopted. Do you think it can be done? And if so, when? <laughs> when? Oh, absolutely. Everything can be done. And I think we've proven since uh, February 24th, time and again, that uh, the world, the free world, not just Europe, is united because it is not just Ukraine that is under attack. Every single core principle upon which we've built international security and European security has come under attack. These concepts and notions of territorial integrity and sovereignty, uh, they're all under attack. And we frankly have no choice. We need to help Ukraine win and we need to ensure that aggression as a tool of statecraft is fundamentally discredited. Now, what we need to do is raise the cost of aggression through additional sanctions and political isolation. Uh, Europe has done a lot, but obviously the war is still going on. So that means only one thing. We need to do more. And Estonia will continuously uh, push for additional measures. We will also work to ensure that the sanctions that have been adopted are actually implemented, which is at, at least as important as adding new sanctions. We need to continue helping Ukraine. Militarily, there should be no taboos uh, when it comes to weapon systems that uh, are supplied to Ukraine. If uh, our military experts deem certain weapon systems uh, necessary, uh, and if we have them, then we should help uh, Ukrainian armed forces with everything we possibly uh, can. Uh, it means economic assistance, development assi assistance, and also political assistance, so that the Ukrainian people knew that uh, the free world is fully, fully, uh, behind them. We are. It's just important that everybody understands that this is not a position we will change. We are in uh, for the long haul for as long as it takes. Uh, and finally, it's so important to ensure um, um, accountability. Uh, we are those who represent a rules-based world order. Uh, the most basic of these rules is that you cannot legally invade your neighbor. You cannot yeah. Uh, chump parts of its territory away, you cannot um, initiate uh, aggression. These uh, um, uh, are illegal acts. Uh, we need to condemn them. We have condemned them. But we also need to ensure that there is a legal proceeding that we establish that eventually brings those responsible for, for these crimes to uh, justice. This is not easily accomplished. None of these things is easy. Uh, but as the Ukrainian people know better than we do, war isn't easy, uh, but that is no excuse for not uh, 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 striving for those goals. And we in Estonia, we at least uh, intend to uh, do everything that we can to ensure more sanctions, more assistance to Ukraine and accountability for those responsible for crimes.
Yes, thank you. Yeah, and, and Russia should be punished for all the crimes it's conducted during this uh, brutal war. So, Estonia provides us with lots of weapons and we are so grateful for this. But at the same time, Estonian government also plans to first seize Russian assets and then give Ukraine all the money. So, how Estonia sets an example for the West in this? Well, that's what we're trying to do. We're always trying to uh, not only, um, as the Americans would say, talk the talk, but also walk the walk. Um, the, one of the major counter-arguments, uh, always, uh, be it military assistance or sanctions, is that certain things cannot be done. Our message is always, if there is a will, there is a way. Uh, yes, seizing assets is um, extremely difficult, uh, legally, uh, but it's not impossible. So we are working within the European Union to find a way uh, to do so as the European Union. Uh, and uh, there are a number of um, uh, work streams um, in progress. Uh, many of these could take a lot of time, but we are making progress. But we nationally, as Estonia, have decided to see what we could do within our own legal system. Uh, so it was actually uh, just today uh, when our government decide, discussed uh, these measures. Uh, we are working on additional new draft uh, bills uh, to make it possible. It's, I'm not going to be uh, hiding the fact that none of this is easy and uh, none of this uh, is uh, going to necessarily be very, very quick. But the message that we need to send is that no matter how long it takes, uh, we are focused on the goal. We will not lose this focus. We will not be deterred. And every single day that uh, Russia continues this aggression, uh, our resolve will only grow stronger. When... Um, uh, some in Moscow uh, expected, before February 21st, 4th of last year, expected um, for um, the West to uh, implement sanctions, but do it only symbolically yeah, and temporarily. Neutral. Then everything that we do today needs to send a message that that analysis was wrong, is wrong, that the opposite is true. Every day that goes by, every day that goes by, the cost of this aggression on Russia will only grow. This is not aimed at hurting uh, Russia. This is aimed at ending aggression uh, and restoring um, peace and stability in Europe that can only stand on uh, Ukraine uh, regaining full territorial integrity and sovereignty within its internationally recognized borders. That is our only goal. And uh, it needs to be clear that we will not tire we will not uh, accept a plateau. We will not pause our activities. No, to the contrary. This war needs to end. And the way to end this war, uh, the, the, the solution, the formula is as simple as it can ever be. Russia needs to pull its troops out, pull yeah. them out. Mr. Seviev, uh, Estonian government, as far as I understand, requested from the Germany permission to give us cluster munitions. Did you receive that permission? Well, I cannot discuss um, um, initiatives that are taking place between allies publicly in detail, but I can assure you that we are, we are continuously working on all aspects of our policy that I laid out earlier, military assistance being one of them. Uh, we have given a lot um, ourselves. We are constantly uh, discussing with allies uh, things that we could additionally do. It is very, very important for us to maintain our unity but also very important to make uh, continuous progress on the um, weapon systems that are provided, uh, because obviously, as you know better than we do, uh, Ukraine needs a lot. Uh, just recently, the Prime Minister of Estonia, Kaya Kala, said that uh, your country will not be able to help new Ukrainian refugees as before if their number increases sharply. Is this still the case? Uh, is this case still on the table? What the Prime Minister was referring to was the fact that uh, we have uh, uh, now uh, a significant number of Ukrainian citizens uh, who have been welcomed in Estonia. We, uh, the Estonian people are extremely welcoming. Um, the number is, if I'm not mistaken, it is significantly above 3% of our population already. And, uh, and as such, on a per capita basis, it is one of the highest in uh, um, uh, Europe. 
And obviously, uh, I mean, we would need uh, uh, help from other European Union member states if we were to accept or if we were to receive uh, significant additional numbers of re refugees. What we need to do is um, um, end this aggression, um, restore Ukraine's territorial integrity, um, then put in place processes that lead to the um, reconstruction of Ukraine, not by building what you have lost back, but by building back better, as Joe Biden would say, yeah. uh, so that Ukraine would also meet all of the EU uh, uh, membership criteria. And uh, that way, encourage the Ukrainians who have had to uh, flee, encourage uh, Ukrainians to return back home, which can only happen once, obviously, this war uh, is won. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Vsevio, for joining us today and for your insight. This was uh, Jonathan Vsevio, Secretary General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Estonia. And this is all for tonight in my part of Spotlight Ukraine. Next week will be more. And now back to you, Volodymyr. Solid plan. Thank you so much, Yuri Fieser. Our global news editor was in the studio and we continue. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Latest news, trends and analytics on all about Ukraine. Like, share and subscribe. Any questions, proposals and comments, contact us via email.